2016 is not done being the year of the reefer. All right. Now, I just did a video about how all the reefer madness just kind of melted away and fizzled out, and now it's pretty much done. There's really nothing left of it. It's all debunked, and it's not really that it's debunked. We didn't have to go in there and write a big debunking article and put it up on billboards and let people, you know, disseminate that through <clears throat> networks of whatever. It wasn't like that at all. It was very much an evolutionary process of uh, information getting out to the public. And now people have a better understanding of what marijuana is and just being exposed to it and medical marijuana especially has led to um, not just the public sentiment being, yeah, let's, let's not throw people in jail for it. Yeah, let's tax and regulate it. Um, yeah, it's medicine. Let's let people use it for medicine. Um, you know, it's, let's normalize it. And the more that that happens, the more that uh, the, the stereotypes and the, stig the stig stigma of it being bad and that people that use it are dumb and lazy and stoners are, and, you know, and all the news reporting is all about the munchies and giggle, giggle, ha, ha. There's never any serious stories. And that's probably why you're here now because I'm, you know, like the antithesis of what marijuana reporting has been in my life's experience. <clears throat> my whole life I've been looking for the right person to be doing reports on this in the mainstream media Never found it. Never found anybody that was really groundbreaking on their coverage of marijuana. I mean, you know, from time to time you had somebody that wasn't actually cracking the stupid jokes and talking about Taco Bells, you know, just none of that. We don't want none of that here. We don't engage in talking about busts, no matter how big they are or how many plants were seized or how many guns they had or how many millions of dollars because none of that matters, you know. What does matter is people not going to jail for marijuana. And one of the ways they've been doing it is with this so-called drug driving or marijuana driving or stone driving or whatever. Take your pick. Um, all these places that had marijuana on the ballots all had reefer madness. They all have talk about this. And a lot of the laws that just got signed into law actually mention these, uh, you know, drug driving things. Michigan's new law has it in it. Uh, Massachusetts law had it in it. And they're basically talking about you can't drive while you're stoned. All right? We, we get that. We understand that that's probably a bad thing. But what we don't understand is how you're going to get there from this person smoked marijuana sometime in the last 30 days to we have this number on a marijuana breathalyzer or a blood sample that says you have this much marijuana in your system, so therefore you're impaired. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that because of metabolize, your system will metabolize marijuana before you get so impaired. Or, let's stop with the impaired until you get so high that you can no longer drive a vehicle. I, I could smoke a, a lot of marijuana, concentrated or whatever, and still drive a vehicle. You know, I'm I'm not out there trying to do that. I'm not out there like, oh, tsh, I'm going to go get high as hell and just go for a ride. It, it's not what you do, all right? And if you are, you know, smoking a lot of marijuana and you want to drive after you've done that, um, I'm sure that you either wait for a minute if you're really, really high, like you're still seeing blackout fields and your, you know, your heartbeat feels like someone just ran a mile, you know, like, I don't think you're going to be that high off of marijuana, but if you are, you might want to wait five minutes and then drive. So I'm out here um, endorsing driving on marijuana because it's not a big deal. Um, I, I, the only thing that really sucks is when you don't have enough joints for that road trip, you know, because nothing's worse than driving a long trip with no marijuana. <clears throat> Now, if you're in Arizona and you're a medical marijuana patient, you have protection thanks to a uh, appeals court ruling in Arizona, which basically says that medical marijuana patients arrested for driving under the influence of the drug can contest DUI charges by arguing before a judge that they weren't too high to operate an automobile. I like the use of the word high there instead of the uh, word impaired. 
Because the word impaired implies that you will do something faulty because you're you just don't have full control of your uh you know your 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 facilities your your motor skills are a little off so you might have a slow reaction or you might have some decision making that ain't all that you know conducive to safety uh so anyway we're gonna try to get through this this stemmed from an arrest in 2013 of Nadir Ishak Arizona man who had been stopped by Mesa police after a car had been driving, allegedly drifted into another lane. An arresting officer later testified that Ishak's eyes were bloodshot and watery and said that he had admitted to smoking marijuana earlier that day. Earlier that day, he's not high. <laughs> he's not even high. So being stoned or drug driving, is not, it's not qualify that. It doesn't qualify for that. Just because you have some marijuana in your system, which it can be there for 30 days, it doesn't mean you're impaired at all or high or any of that stuff. Ishaq was sub subsequently charged in one count each of driving while impaired to the slightest de degree. That's the whole. That's the name of that charge. It shouldn't even be a thing. Driving while impaired to the slightest degree. That's just designed for a bargaining chip so that they can drop the real charge down. Oh, yeah. The one that he got stuck with on this, in this case was that marijuana was in his body while he was driving. Um, it can be there for 30 days. So, you know, that's, I'm guessing that's why the, the law in Arizona has in it, the medical marijuana law already has in it protection for people so that, you know, right here, it authorizes patients such as ISHAC to have marijuana in their system. Now, this was a 2010 law. And in 2015, the state Supreme Court decided that patients charged with a DUI can argue that the concentration of marijuana or its impairing metabolite in their body was uh, sufficient to cause impairment. Um, he had uh, 26.9 nanograms of THC in his body. Now that's uh, per gram of, per milliliter of blood. Nanograms per milliliter. Wow. So that's a really small amount. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's like you can smoke marijuana and hours later still test for 45 nanograms. Up to 12 hours later. It's a fact. So... Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, Arizona, you are now free to drive after smoking your joints or doing your dabs or whatever. I don't recommend, you know, if you just did a dab, you probably don't want to just jump behind the wheel right off the rip. But you might, you know, want to make sure you're still going to be awake after about 10 minutes too. I get really tired after about a half hour after I did a dab. So if you're on a, if you got like a little bit of a drive, you might not want to do a bunch of dabs right before you jump behind the wheel. But um, when it comes to marijuana, unlike alcohol, alcohol is almost like surefire. You drink two or three beers, you shouldn't drive. You drink five beers, you're probably going to get in a wreck. You drink 10 beers and you get behind the wheel, I guarantee you, you're either going to get pulled over or in a wreck. So that's weird, ain't it? I mean, some people obviously this don't apply because they can drink 30 beers and still drive. And that's just, it's kind of weird and it's sad, but, you know, people that never drink and, people that never drink and drive, they're the ones that cause the crashes. Like, we're in the holiday season, you got Christmas and New Year's Eve, two famous nights for alcohol uh, fatalities. Um, the numbers are going to come in and we're going to be like, whoa, that was a lot of people. How many people died from smoking marijuana and driving over the holiday season? How many people died ever from just smoking marijuana? Um, none. Colorado is trying to claim that they have like 39 or so people that when they, you know, when they died in their car crash, they had marijuana only in their system. <clears throat> the problem I have with that number is it doesn't tell you whether they were the car, uh, they were the driver, they were at fault, whether they... Um, smoke marijuana that day, how many nanograms did they have in their system? You know, you, it would help you, your case, if you're trying to ban THC in the blood while driving, 
you got to come up with a number that makes sense, all right? This saying that this guy with like less than 30 nanograms in his system is bullshit, all right? I'm saying that, you know, 45, you can still have 45, 12 hours after you smoke some weed. You know, I mean, you're talking about days later, you're going to find some nanograms. Does that mean that person's high? And to each his own, and every person's different. But I guarantee you, somewhere in the ballpark of 20 nanograms, nobody's probably high. But, like, if you're brand new at smoking weed, I'd exercise caution with everything you do. You know, I mean, if you're doing medical marijuana for the first few times, yeah, I'm here to tell you, you probably feel a little bit more nervous and cautious the first time or two that you drive. Pretend like you're going back to driver's training again and just go through the motions, you know, um, to get yourself prepared for real world stuff. Just drive around a downtown area where you got slow speed limits and a lot of traffic. And it, this isn't that hard of stuff, people. Driving a car is not that hard. And marijuana is not that impairing.